This is a long time coming. Yeah, really. This is, I mean, I was trying to think of like whenever, I mean, I started this around like almost seven years ago now. Okay. And I think back then, uh, I reached out at one point and I just never followed up with it. Yeah. But this is a long time coming. I'm excited about it. I appreciate it. it. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, I mean, whenever I think of... Carson Street Deli, like, you were the face that I think of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for a long time, I mean, I bought it probably almost three years ago now. Okay. But even before that, you know, I was highly involved in... You were there. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, so my initiation with Southside, I started working at a place called uh, Threads. Oh, yeah. Uh, I worked there, and I would come in, and I would get sandwiches all the time. And, like, that had to be, like, I don't know, I'd say... 2014 maybe 2015 2016 around there and uh that's whenever my introduction to you know carson street deli really like came into play but you've you've always been there since then i've been there since well i think this is 14 years this month 14 years this month yeah yeah that's uh (laughs) i mean that's that's great yeah yeah i I feel like that that really like kind of speaks to you know the business that it is for yeah. people to retain employment for that long yeah. like, like the place that i work the reason that i still work there is uh-huh. like great guys they have all been there over 20 years for sure you know i'm the youngest guy there they're yeah. all been there for 20 plus years so it's like it got to be some yeah some, we're uh we're very lucky in that regard and our turnover is basically zero um usually somebody either leaves the industry or wants to do something else but like we just hired somebody and previously to that, I think it was two or three years to our previous hire. That's great. And that's, you know, in our industry, usually it's... Yeah, right. it's a quick turnover. turnover. But yeah, we very lucky, very good staff. So we do our best to retain. That's that. good. Yeah. Now, I mean, where, I mean, where have you, are you from Pittsburgh? Um, I kind of grew up in Butler. So just like a little bit north here. And I've been down here since like 2006 or so, so... What brings you to Pittsburgh from Butler? Uh, I came down here for school. I went to the Art Institute. I was going to guess it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to guess it. All the creatives that have like interesting businesses that yeah. have come on here, uh-huh. so many of them are just like, yeah, I was at the Art Institute yeah, for a minute. Yeah, totally. What, yeah. what, what, what was your uh, direction there? Um, I went to school for uh, digital media film production. Okay. And um, graduated in like 09 did that for like a year or so and that industry just was not my vibe yeah um just like real hardcore and like everybody's like super high stress and really like well what uh, is give me an example of like a a job that you would get with that major um i mean just going into it i did a lot of like production assistant work and stuff like that yeah and um what's like a perfect picture for you like what was your goal in that um long i I'd, I'd hope to get into like editing and, oh, and okay, stuff yeah. like that on like the back end yeah but um yeah doing a couple like pa jobs just kind of put a bad taste in my mouth so <laughs> that's <laughs> started a, doing other stuff <laughs> that's a good part about it immediately yeah. you're like uh yeah this yeah. isn't for me yeah. uh well so i mean obviously you have an interest in film and stuff like let's rewind a little bit like yeah. whenever you're growing up what kind of stuff are you into um so i actually got into like film and stuff like that in high school um and butler at the time and i'm not sure if they still have it or not but they had like a film production studio we did like you know our morning programming we filmed all the shows and stuff that they put on so i got into like um production in high school really and even at that same time i I was also in orchestra so i played music so that just kind of like those kind of like creative all those juices are flowing yeah exactly and then um, my teacher in high school actually taught at the art institute at the time So I just ended up going there. Wow. So uh, you said you were involved in the production like through school. Were you just having like a every day you have like morning announcements and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like generally pretty high production. We did like a three camera shoot. We (sighs) did, um, you know, 
pre-taped stuff all the time so i had like a regular segment on there and then i would direct the morning show and then we would um like shoot and direct any like talent shows or you know band stuff and all that wow kind of stuff. yeah how many people did you graduate with um, at that time, it was like over 900. Holy shit. It was very, very big. I know okay. Butler is much smaller than that now. Like wow. They've really drastically. I gone, can't even gone down, conceptualize yeah. it. We were I mean, a quarter of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I went to Elizabeth Forward a little bit, uh, uh, and, and it's a little bit smaller than that, but it kind of. You know, I'm, I immediately I'm wondering like, why the hell didn't we have this like everyday production? Yeah, in the morning, but that's so cool. Yeah, uh, you got in with. I mean, like you were involved with that like all four years. So that was um, well. Also, what was unique about Butler was junior high, intermediate high, and senior high were actually different buildings. So seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. Wow, were separate buildings, kind of like around the city, just because the student body was so large, we couldn't fit everybody in one building so huh. i did that um uh like my uh junior senior year wow the video production stuff and when you're i mean like when you're not in school uh like what kind of stuff are you into you, i know you said you were in band what did you play um i played bass upright bass oh cool so um i played like in a band at that time too and then um still played music and played music for a long time um in pittsburgh in a band called the armadillos wow we were around for Many, many years. And but what kind of music? It was like Americana folk music. Ah, cool. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, like you, I mean, in high school, you're you're doing all this stuff with music and with, uh, you know, film and everything like that. I mean, what is, I mean, what was your idea of what you wanted to do? You, I mean, did you have an idea or you just kind of were led to the Art Institute? Yeah, I was kind of led to the Art Institute. I had this like idea of what that would be like, and it seemed like something I would want to get into. Um, so, <laughs> sounds all unique. Did you have one of them people like come in and give like a presentation of like uh, you know we had like the trade schools come in and it yeah. would sound so cool, like build robots at yeah. Pittsburgh Technical and all that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, for sure, it was definitely like that. Were I mean, you, did you go to the Art Institute? I did not. I okay. went to Pittsburgh Technical College. Okay, <laughs> yeah, gotcha. PTI whenever it was around. Which which uh, I just heard actually a couple weeks ago. It's closing, as yeah. you would think, or as you would uh, assume with all the rest of these technical schools. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy to think about, like, you know, all these different schools. Uh, uh, I just saw the stuff with the Art Institute uh, and, like, the loan forgiveness with that. So Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. When did it even close? Like, a while back, right? Yeah, I mean, it had moved. When I went there, the building was downtown, right on Boulevard of the Allies, and then... Even when I, from when I started to when I graduated, I could see it was already on the downhill slope. And then it moved to like a tiny little <laughs> building and just like drastically went downhill after that. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I've said it on here before, but I, I, would, I would guess like out of, I mean, there has to be 30, 40 people that have had on here now that have uh -huh. been there. Yeah. And I would say maybe only like two of them have been like, it was a great experience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the rest were always like, they were figuring it out, trying to at least. Uh -huh. But so, I mean, in high school and stuff, are you like just a, a, a fan of like movies, like a hardcore fan of movies? Yeah. Movies, TVs, uh, stuff like that. Um, Where does that come from? Like, like, are you like a blockbuster kid growing up? Like, go to the video rental? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I was always trying to, like, get my parents to take me to Blockbuster. Trying to get, like, a VHS player in my room was, like, my big goal. Oh, that yeah. never happened. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just really, like, production um, of, of, like, film and stuff like that from a young age. Is there, like, uh, a movie that you remember watching where you're like, this is absolutely insane that this is... Like, what is that for you? I mean, I know it's kind of cliche, but, like, Star Wars... Yeah was like yeah i always wanted them to rent all three movies and do like a marathon it's like once a year they would let me do it how old are you i'm 37 okay so yeah a couple it, i'm 34 uh just turned 34 so i feel like if i was a few years older mm -hmm. i would have like even more of a tie to star wars yeah you know i like it but my star wars that i like I remember, you know, one, two, and three. Yeah, yeah. You know, Darth Maul. I was Darth Maul for Halloween and shit. Oh, nice. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, so it's cool to, like, think about that. But I can't even imagine, like, you know, uh, 
getting exposed to star wars as like you know someone a little bit older where you're like seeing that where you're actually like able to like yeah. you know comprehend it mm -hmm. uh because it kind of skipped right past all the realistic effects with uh the phantom menace <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know? but uh still cool so yeah. i mean you you go through uh school and you end up at the art institute and then like you know what's after the art institute um after that after i stopped after I decided I didn't want to do that anymore, I just got like odd jobs and I worked at a dry cleaners that was right beside the deli. Wow. So um, I worked there for like a couple of years. That was actually one of the best jobs I ever had because we were dead all the time. I would just read all day long <laughs> and we were like a drop off pickup kind of place. So I didn't have to do anything other than check stuff in and give it out. Yeah. They were just paying me to read all day. It was great. But then I knew the deli crew because it was right next door. So that ended up closing. And when that closed, um, Mike, the previous owner to me, was like, hey, if you need a job, let us know. And I started working there. It, was that always called Carson Street Deli? Yep. Yeah. And so it, uh, it used to be located um, like right across from Nakama. Yeah. And then it moved to the location that it's in now. And that was owners before Mike. That was um, Eric and Aaron. They moved it to where it's at now. And then Mike bought it. And then on to me. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, were you like a frequent of the South Side while you were in the Art Institute? Yeah, I lived in South Side. I lived in the slopes. Oh wow! Um, for many many years. Were you a beehive kid? Yep, beehive all the time. Even in high school and stuff like that, that was like the cool like yeah. go smoke cigarettes and drink yeah, yeah. tea. Clove the cigarettes. I yeah. immediately oh, yeah. smell clove cigarettes as soon as I even <laughs> yeah. say the beehive. Yeah. Uh, what an interesting place, you know? Absolutely. I, it's uh, it's it's wild. Uh, there's a guy who wrote a book. Uh, uh, David Rulo, I had him on and he, uh, it's just so wild that like, you know, kind of captured like light, light, lightning in a bottle at that yeah, place. For sure. Uh, it's a shame that you don't really have that like sort of, uh, I don't know that hangout. Like, were you always just like hanging out there? Like, what did you do when you were at the beehive? Um, smoke cigarettes, listen yeah, to music, drink absolutely. coffee. hundred percent. I know. And it's <laughs> yeah. just like, I, I feel like people can't really conceptualize, uh, just going someplace and like being and existing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was of course pre like, you know, cell phones. Cell phones That's really what destroyed it. <laughs> yeah. You had to go congregate in an area to yeah. be able to be like, you know, that's like real FOMO. Yeah. Like if you weren't there yeah, now, everyone sure. could just get a text. <laughs> yeah terrible yeah uh, now if you were in the south side and you ended up working at the laundromat i mean that's just a you just needed a job yeah yeah pretty much um i mean previous to that i worked at a place called paparazzi's which was a restaurant which is a crazy crazy restaurant um <laughs> with, like crazy mob ties to it and it was real interesting is but, it still around no no it closed that's where um bonfire is now oh okay like, like right on the corner there yeah um paparazzis yeah <laughs> i'll have to look that one up i'm uh, sure you're gonna find news articles <laughs> i mean uh, uh, so uh, what brings you like what's your initiation to like working in the food industry is it just like kind of anything finding a job like that uh, yeah yeah like kind of odd jobs in um i mean in high school and stuff i worked at a pizza for a long time okay and uh stuff like that so wow just, let me ask you about this so you worked yeah. at a pizza hut for a long time you said yeah. now was it uh at the point where they hired acts to come in during the week still like did you remember that at all no that was before my time my probably when you were a kid though yeah totally so my pizza hut still had a buffet hell yeah and when i worked there it still had a smoking section wow which was literally just half the restaurant was smoking <laughs> yeah. half the restaurant it's wasn't. so crazy to think about that yeah, yeah after church going into eaton park smoking or non-smoking if <laughs> yeah. nana was there we were in smoking just yeah. hacking yeah <laughs> wow uh, what a crazy thing yeah. so uh the only reason i even brought that up is uh i interviewed a magician on here lee trebosic and he is you know he's pretty famous in the city uh he did the who Houdini event downtown, but he got, you know, he earned his stripes as a guy, as a magician performing at Pizza Hut. Oh my God, that's like, awesome. I know how cool of a job that is. <laughs> yeah, like, definitely. From like 12 years old, this uh -huh. dude's like, you know, raking it in as a 12 nice. year old to, to do yeah. magic tricks. But uh, Pizza Hut, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like it's like a, you know, initiation working at a pizza stop. Yeah, uh, yeah, a, for a sure. Pizza place. Yeah. Now you, I mean, like the laundry. I mean, how long were you there? That was probably mm, probably two years or so, and then they ended up closing down, and I went to the deli. 
and 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 you were just reading there. You're a big reader. Uh, I was during that period of time. Yeah, we had a lot of free time. Probably. <laughs> yeah, outside of that, <laughs> not so much. Yeah. So the deli, I mean, that just was just fell in front of you, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, they were like, uh, "If you need a job, let us know." And I'm like, "Cool, hit me up when you guys need somebody." And I was on unemployment for a couple, maybe like a month or so after the the dry cleaners closed, and then I just started working there. Was it pretty much like the same type of menu? The menu was very similar. Um, but we did not have beer at the time, or we had a small bottle selection, and we had three taps like in the back behind the line. Yeah. Um, so that was before we had the bar put in or anything like that. Wow. Yeah. So just sandwich shop. Pretty much just sandwich shop. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. When Mike bought it, he he got a liquor license with when he bought the the deli just a couple six packs ago and stuff like that, and he had always planned on eventually putting the bar in and whatnot. So he did that probably a year or two after I started working there. Well, let me uh, let me rewind a little bit. So you said the first owners, Aaron and... Eric and Aaron. Eric and Aaron. That, Do you know when that opened? So originally it opened... Um, actually, when I was like getting my LLC together and all that kind of stuff, they were looking up the original records for the deli, and it's been open 30 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's pretty. Time. That's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's been down there, and then Mike ended up taking this over. Mm -hmm. And how long was how long did Mike have this? He owned it over ten years, I think. And I mean, like, so you, I mean, let me ask you this: so you get in there, and you're just, you know, I'm, I mean, do you have any idea that that's going to be like? Obviously, you don't have any idea that that's going to be like a career shift. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, at the time, I was like, cool, I'll sling sandwiches for a while, and then see what happens. But um, after working there a while and starting to transition, when he started transition to a beer bar, yeah, um, I got way into it, way into like learning about craft beer and stuff like that. What year is this? This is probably oh six, oh oh five, maybe. It's later than that. It was probably oh nine, okay, or oh ten, okay. And when Mike put it in the bar and was like, "We're gonna do only local." breweries people were like you're crazy <laughs> like you are nuts there was literally like a few local breweries at that time yeah nobody was doing only like local beers on tap yeah because like okay in, in 2000 obviously now in pittsburgh like the the microbrewery scene the brewery scene in general is just absolutely insane absolutely yeah but but in 2010 like you know speak to a little bit of what that is like how many breweries are there now i think that on the uh uh, Pittsburgh Brewers Guild right now, mm -hmm. there might be over 50 now. Yeah, yeah, uh, that sounds right. I think that there's over 50 now, but I, I mean, what was it like back then? At that time, it was like East End Church Brew Works. Um, this was pre Was that Pen? Was Pen around? Pen was around. Uh, I'm trying to think. And yeah. there was a few other just like regional ones. You know, Trogues and stuff like that. We were yeah. getting a lot of those kind of things. Now, was the owner, Mike, was he like a beer guy? Like, what, what like, initiated that, like, transition to, like... Because what you guys now, if you walk in your spot, yeah. you have an abundance of a selection yeah, of beers. So, obviously, you leaned into it. Yeah. But to get... Uh, to get started with that, I feel like would be so overwhelming. Absolutely, yeah. It was. He was actually like he's a ex uh, investment banker, and he had retired, <laughs> and he was a big like home brewer and stuff like that. Oh. So he wanted to get into something beer related, and it happened to fall into place to where he could get a liquor license and get the deli. Yeah. And it all wow. just kind of came together. That's awesome. Yeah. So his idea to, you know, only carry local, you know, I, I mean, I obviously don't know Mike, but like, did he have some sort of like, you know, uh, ridiculous passion for the city of Pittsburgh that he only wanted to do that? Like, what was his motive behind that? Do you know it all? Honestly, I think it was just like, he, he kind of saw it coming almost. Oh, okay. And that, um, that's cool though. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting to think about, you know, the people that are uh, doing things and kind of going that route because it's obviously like the long game. Yeah. You know, you could just do all the corporate, mm -hmm. you know, mainstream type of shit. But yeah. to just like do the local stuff whenever there's not too many people around, that's pretty wild. Yeah. Now, was there only like a couple different selections whenever you came in? Yeah. I mean, at that time, once we... After we put the bar in, we would get, if anything was local, we would try and get a hold of it. So it would, at long run, worked out for us because I was able to create relationships with all these breweries 
as they're coming into play, as mm. they're just opening. Like we were the first to get Grist, first to get Hitchhiker, Cinderland, all the big guys now. Wow. When they were just first started out, they know, oh, these guys carry local beers. So we were able to kind of make good lasting relationships with all these guys. And at the time when we first started, we would get regular like regional PA breweries, anything we could, because we have 20 taps so yeah. we would, and some arsenal and stuff like that we would carry. And, um, and, and then just as more and more popped up, we would be able to put more and more exclusively local stuff on tap. We would have like a few out of towners, but, um, you know, we tried to get as many locals as we could at the time. Yeah. As the community builds, it's like you have that selection to like, you know, interchange in and out. Yeah. Uh, now, I mean, your experience in beer in that moment, like, you know, 2010, like, are you a beer person? I had no idea. I didn't know anything about beer. I like drink PBR and like Schlitz, you know, with my friends at the time. Stereotypical. Yeah. And I mean, how do you approach that? Like, I mean, because the craft beer is so weird. I'm not a big drinker, Mm -hmm. uh, but I tried to inject myself into a crash course of the Pittsburgh Brewers Guild Mm -hmm. because I wanted to start interviewing these people that are doing all this great stuff, but I didn't want to like ever have... Uh, I didn't want to not have any exposure to the product. I want to be able to like have yeah. my opinions on it. But I mean, were you someone that was into beer? I mean, was it hard for you to you know become versed in this like whole different world? I would say it took a long time. Really, it was just for me. I started out just making sandwiches, and um, I just tried to listen to what people talked about as much as I possibly could and just soak up as much information as I could taste as many beers as I could and try and, you know, learn the lingo. What does this mean when you're describing it, you know, and tasting it, what does that actually taste like? Um, or what is that flavor that you're getting and trying to, I guess, just get as much information as I could. And, um, eventually, you know, it becoming a job. Yeah. That's super wild. Uh, it's just wild. I, cause I feel like it's, you know, we were saying like to be an innovator of something to like try to, you know, cultivate this like spot for all these different craft beers. I feel like it would be difficult to be able to do that to like, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and inject yourself with this whole different, like, you know, this whole different thing. Yeah. It's cool to think that he, you know, kind of saw something coming in the craft brewery scene. Do you, did you notice like, uh, uh, a quick a quick rise and like more brewers popping up yeah i would say i mean it was generally pretty fast once we popped up and people started that was like the craft brew like boom started at that same time yeah and there was regional breweries that were becoming more popular and like you know even like dogfish or rheingeist you know people like that and fatheads um breweries like that to where it started to really kick in and people started to seek it out more okay and then i feel like that just collided at the same time wow so i mean i know that this is a broad question it's probably like uh i don't know but like what keeps you in to just working at a deli to turning it into you know buying it and uh making it yours like 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 what what were the hooks that were into you Um, I feel like it became like a part of who I was eventually. Um, like when I took over, I started like from the bottom, just slowly worked my way up, like shift manager to, you know, general manager and, and so on and so forth. So, and like the culture there kind of like, and I think that's part of why we retain employees so much. Like the culture kind of like grabs you and brings you in. We try and it's like a supportive environment It's a positive environment and um, the people who come in there are regulars and the people in the neighborhood and even just working with brewers and stuff like that. um, It's just like a nice vibe and uh, it's just became something that I really kind of fell in love with and then just kind of like became a part of who I was at the same time. That's a good answer. I mean, it, it, you often hear, you know, negative about the food industry. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting, you know, I assume that Mike kind of ran it that way. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, he would have to, for else he would probably be gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he would probably left and found something better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's, I mean, like, that's cool to think that he, you know, the way that he ran a business, like, wanted to, you know, keep you in and wanted you to, to grow and mm-hmm. be able to expand. Like, in that time, you know, for you to, for you guys, obviously, to, like, lean into the beer end of it all, because, I mean, I would assume that that's, along with the great food that you do, but, like, you know, you're a big stop for beer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, how do you... Is there like any sort of like formal education that you like are starting to like think about like taking to like try to lean into that and learn more about that? Um, I've always thought about getting like Cicerone training or Cicerone certified. Um, but I mean, that was before I became the owner and now. Yeah, <laughs> now you're a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in 10 years of you going from the beginning to, you know, ultimately, you know, how does the end of Carson Street Deli for Mike happen? Like, was he just wanting to get out of the the, the business? Yeah, so basically he... Um, it, we were talking about me becoming a partner or something like that for a long time, and then he had a really bad bike accident he was Mm. on a bicycle going down the road at like 30 miles an hour and hit a rock face first into the road jesus and just destroyed his face and was in the hospital for a long time oh my god and um it was very serious and at that point i just took over all operations of the deli because he had to yeah he was out of commission yeah and i mean luckily i was there to to be there and help and um through that he just kind of realized like, you know, he just wanted to relax and chill and didn't want to worry about the ownership of a business and wanted to, and the opportunity became, so he wanted to hand it down. He didn't want to just sell it to whoever. Yeah. Yeah. So it just ended up working out where I was able to take over at that point. That's cool. Wow. That's, uh, that's unfortunate that, you know, that's how, Things He's all good be. now. That's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, now, He's living it up. Are you uh, so so? As you you know, kind of. I mean, was this always like a kind of a plan? You said you talked about like you know you being a partner. Mm-hmm. You know how how far into your work there was that something that you thought about? Like you know, I want this to be more than just like you know going to work. Yeah, I think as I took on more and more responsibility and took on more roles in the deli. Um, it just became like, that was an option at that point. Whereas before I was like, it's not really, I'm just making sandwiches or something like that, which is fine. You could still make a good living doing that, but it came more of like an option to be a long-term career Yeah, instead of just a job. Yeah. So for you to, you know, prepare to, you know, buy a business and do this, you know, how, uh, is that super, super anxiety inducing? Oh yeah. That's a nightmare for sure. (laughs) It was like we, uh, Mike and I had this idea in our head. It's just like, we're just going to write up a little piece of paper. We'll sign it. You'll sign it. I'll sign it. We'll send it off. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the lawyers get involved. They're like, no, you can absolutely not do this. We need a contract. We need this. We need all that. Uh, it's a long, it's a rough process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you buy the building with it or you guys rent that? We rent it. Um, unfortunately. I mean, like it's, it's that's why I asked that yeah. because it's not like out of my you know I feel like it's understood like it's a pretty big deal down there all these uh these buildings down in Southside Southside's a unique it's in a unique uh stage would you say yeah yeah definitely it's in a transitional period um we have a lot of community support right now the people who actually live and work in Southside there's been a big movement of support and coming together and trying to get people together which is great to see and it's i think it is slowly on an upturn at this point now let me ask you this why do you think uh i feel like that anyone who is in touch with anything that goes on to the city knows that south side has uh garnered some certain uh what are the words like uh, a reputation reputation yeah. yeah now what do you think is the cause of that because when you when you started to frequent the south side like what was what was the environment there Honestly, it was exactly the same. I think that I, I can even remember doing a piece in college and uh, it was called, Is the South Side Drowning? Because it was just like drunk party kids, like going crazy and stuff like that. And that's what it's always been. Yeah. It hasn't really changed. I think the only thing that's changed is the perception of it or what the media is portraying wants it as. To portray it as 100%. Million percent. Because these things happened 
when I was a kid too, the same exact things that were happening now were happening then, only it didn't get the media attention that it does now. Yeah. So it's just picked up more and is perceived in a negative connotation where in reality, it's very similar to what it's always been. Yeah, that's fascinating because you you started down there what 2010? Like, uh, yeah, just, even before that, I worked at Paparazzi's. That was that restaurant. That was probably mid 2008, 2009. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, back then to there. So obviously, uh, 2010 in the early 2010s. You know, I was down there a lot. You know, Southside was crazy. It yeah. was always just like a lot of people, a lot of foot mm-hmm. traffic. It was a great time. Yep. What do you think caused the whole negative reputation that has been uh, doing that? I mean, like you say that it's the same, but obviously, like you know, you see different things that happen in there. But like, what do you think causes that? Honestly, it's hard to say. I mean, we have had like, you know, businesses have ended up closing and leaving and we have a lot of empty storefronts down there now which is sad to see because like the core group of community who actually live there i feel like has stayed on par but i don't i don't want to blame covid or something like that but there definitely was a shift during those years where it was completely shut down so nobody was partying or anything like that yeah and then it started back up again so it felt like there was like a boom of something that was negative hmm. happening where maybe that wasn't necessarily true. There was just a gap yeah, from when it stopped and when it started again. Well, it's interesting because uh, I have a good friend who lives down there and like we're working on uh, a documentary kind of, I, I, whatever you would call it. It's like some sort of a project of mm-hmm. the South side. Mm-hmm. We've interviewed different business owners down there and uh, we've talked to people just about their experience and it seems exactly like you said. It's the media that uh, are spotlighting or, or highlighting these certain events that just like create this like crazy reputation for the city but yeah all the people that are involved in the city and business owners down there and everything like that i mean there there was a, a business owner he, he's a chef down uh down there i was interviewing him and he was in he had tears in his eyes talking about south side he mm. you know yeah and how much uh love and you know care that the community has for it so it's interesting to hear you know i think it's important to ask you these questions because like you're obviously a business owner you've been down there for you know a long time so Mm -hmm. you could kind of see all aspects of it all yeah uh and you think that uh uh, you think that it's on an upswing i would say right because i feel like i feel like that uh as the news usually does it, it creates these like focal points for a month, two mm-hmm. months, three yep. months. And I feel like the South side, I really don't hear about it as often as you were for a yeah, while. For sure. Absolutely. I mean, do you, do you, uh, like, like when would you say like the first like upswing in businesses, like closing down there would be, um, around COVID obviously. Yeah. COVID hit and that destroyed a lot of people down there who just, I mean, there wasn't the foot traffic that it, the foot traffic, just went away, which yeah. was the support of, of a lot of those restaurants or bars or stuff like that that ended up closing. Yeah. Is there, uh, is there community, like, is there any sort of community organizations that are, like, heavily involved with the South Side down there? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, South Side Community Council is okay. They do an okay job. There's, um, oh, man, now they're all slipping my mind as far as the names, but there's probably South Side Can. Oh, yeah, Southside Can, okay, yeah. One or two other neighborhood groups like that where it's like residents who actually live down there who are trying to get together and and with business owners and working together to try and put a better light on what Southside actually is. Yeah. Uh, Now, whenever you have these, like, community events that they do, like they do the open streets and everything Mm -hmm. like that, it's always just packed. Like, uh, it seems like a great time. Yeah. Uh, Are you, I mean, are you one of the participants in, like, the soup tours and things like that? So we used to sponsor this soup tour, but didn't actually make soup for the tour. Okay. Something happened this year. I don't know if different people were in charge or there was like a slight shift in, in that specific event this year that we ended up not by choice, just not participating in. Yeah. But e- even though like that event or open streets or um, there's like a goat fest, some of those like events really like, bring a lot of people in and, and out to South side. I think those are like really key t- for people to see what it's actually like outside of those few hours on Friday and Saturday night where it's like super crazy. Yeah. 
Uh, are you are you guys like? Uh, what are your hours down there? So we're open um, from like ten to nine during the week, and then we just stay open until ten on the weekends. So we're not open super late. Yeah, um, I mean your, I mean. You obviously do uh, sandwiches, sides, things like that. Mm-hmm. But your bar scene, like like I know that you do bingo, you do like bar bingo and things yep. like that. So you're doing events. Like how long? How like when did that start to come into play as far as like a business model? Like having people coming in to play, you know, this bingo, things like that. Um, that's relatively. Well, I mean, we always did beer events. We did lots of beer events, tap takeovers. We would do firkin tappings or pin tappings, um, collabs, stuff like that we've done for a long time. Just recently, we, we've tried to, like, expand a little more yeah. into, like, some more, like, general still beer-themed. We want to stay beer-themed as much as possible, like, other type events like that. Like, we do a flight night. We do um, where it's like you get a flight and we also do house candied bacon wow. flight and you pair it up and it's like five bucks a piece. So like stuff like that. Jeez. House candied bacon. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, are you, are you like whenever you're not at work, are you a chef at home? No, no. I mean, I, I'm, I do most the cooking, but yeah. Um, yeah, I do it. I'm just like in it so much at work. I try and shut that off yeah when i leave now if possible i mean your menu you have a pretty decent menu there it's like how much has that changed over the years that you've been there so it's slowly mm-hmm. changed like mike added a couple of sandwiches i added a couple of sandwiches one of the things which actually holds me back a little bit at the deli is there are core sandwiches that people have been eating for 20 years hell yeah and if you would take that off the menu oh, they yeah. would freak out yeah I, I can't say the restaurant here uh but he it's a restaurant has a really good smash burger mm-hmm. took it off the menu and uh, i was out to dinner with the owner and he was like dude he was like i never even conceptualized how drastic of a change it would be yeah he said people were fucking pissed oh absolutely uh and that's so wild to even think about yeah yeah i learned that very quickly like you need to keep those core sandwiches that have been on there forever or else people are going to get upset what are like the pillars down there um we have like a the balboa that's like an italian sandwich that's like a lot of parma meats and stuff like that like loaded up and uh like our reuben is is one of our core sandwiches which is a little bit different we make ours with coleslaw instead of sauerkraut oh wow we don't toast the bread which people get very upset about sometimes really (laughs) coming in expecting like a traditional new york style reuben i prefer it untoasted I, I do as well because you taste the bread. I also just don't want my, the top of my mouth sliced up. Absolutely, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's so interesting. Like, like, how far does that go into play? Whenever you're like thinking about these things, I know your menu has been established, mm-hmm. and but but as the owner, you have the power to do these things. Yeah, you know, do you just you know if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Or it's like how do you how do you personalize what you're doing? So I try and we try and be creative with our specials, which we do rotate usually about every two weeks or so. And we'll do those. We'll try and be as creative as possible. And we could be off the wall and do really different stuff with those. And then whichever ones are super popular end up trickling in onto like the permanent menu. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, (laughs) That's so crazy. I think that people just get pissed about stuff. Oh, they would get so mad. Like, we tried to change our bread one time way back in the day from Breadworks baguettes to Mediterra baguettes. Uh, People were insanely pissed. (laughs) I couldn't believe how pissed people were about it. We switched back to Breadworks baguettes. We used Breadworks baguettes. We still use some Mediterra stuff, too, which is a very good bakery. Mediterra, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Now... I mean, I, so I put together this field trip. Like, you guys were the first people who popped in my mind to do this because uh, I'm a big fan of the deli. You know, I, yeah. I would eat there all the time. I have a lot of friends always popping up. But you kind of have a uh, good reputation that I've noticed over the years. Like, and I think it like goes to speak about like what you guys uh, created with like the beer scene and everything like mm-hmm. that. It's like you always see like some good stuff happening. People always say good stuff. I see Ed and Day always like highlighting. Yep what you're doing Mm -hmm. uh but it's cool to like you know uh to be one of these people that want to be involved with the community and like lean into it more and you know want to be involved like how uh how did you i mean was there any other sort of like idea of a job that you wanted to do after you like started this deli was there ever a chance for you to not work there 
Like, did you have any other things that you were like almost about to do? I mean, I feel early on when I was just making sandwiches, I didn't really think about it long term at all. But once I started getting into management, um, I felt like I could stay for a long time. Yeah. And I also feel like the contributing factors to that is like Mike would tell me, um, we're not in the beer business. We're not in the sandwich business. We're in the relationship business. Mm. So pretty much on a regular day when I'm hanging out working or whatever may be the case, a good 75% of the people who come in, I'm on a first name basis. I know what kind of beer you drink. We know what sandwich you like and creating that sort of relationship with our customers and our employees are the same way um, has helped us like retain that reputation and also not compromising um, on quality of product for any reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like uh, that's like you said, the people freak out if you change your bread. Can you imagine <laughs> if you change your meats and stuff oh, like that? Yeah. Yeah. It would be mayhem. <laughs> it would be crazy. Uh, but yeah, like, so I planned that field trip and I wanted to like do like a brown bag lunch and mm -hmm. like, it was very easy to work with you. Everything was great. It was, uh, there was probably, I'd say of the 20 people on there, I would say like maybe 12 of them did not have, uh, Carson street deli before. Oh wow. People loved it. That's awesome. Uh, this lady, uh, this lady was especially excited about the macaroni salad. Yep. Uh, you know, rave reviews on everything. Awesome. But I mean, like, do you guys do like catering and stuff like that too? Yeah. Yeah. We do a pretty decent catering business and I try and be flexible and accommodating for any sort of catering because I know that could be stressful for the person on the other side, um, whether it be like planning for a party or like, you know, we'll do special requests for people. You know, I don't mind going out of my way to, to make a customer happy because it's not that hard for me to do it and yeah. I will accommodate you and then you'll be happy and we'll be happy too. Yeah, it's good for each, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yeah, yours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean like, I don't know, you would think that more business owners would have that sort of like mindset, but you know, you would hope that the businesses that you like to work with have that mindset. Yeah. But sometimes that's not always the case. Uh, it just goes to show why you're still doing what you're doing. Yeah. Now, I mean, as, as obviously you just bought this a couple of years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. like things are developing, but like, what are your goals with this? Um, I mean, long term, I if if we could find a building to own instead of rent, that would be a good goal. That's way down the line. Yeah. Um, a couple of years in the future, maybe like a food truck would be nice to do something like that. But other than that, like, I don't want to change what the deli is in yeah. any way because of that culture we developed. I have no plans to change what it is at its core. We'll always be a beer bar and a sandwich place at of of a high quality now how do you how do you deal with like the uh oversaturation of beer selections and whenever i say oversaturation that's like it usually has a negative connotation but mm -hmm. you know, we have so much good stuff around here it's like how do you really determine what you pick um honestly it's by taste and if the, the beer industry right now in pittsburgh is very competitive you know there are places that are closing there are places that are opening yeah um I want to taste a beer 100% before I put it on tap. And um, I'll be very nice about it. I won't say anything bad about it. But if it's not up to par, I, I won't put it on tap. Yeah. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe down the road, they improve. You know, new breweries need to work out kinks and stuff like that. But I always like to give the new guys a chance, for yeah. sure. So if it's buying a case, buying, you know, one keg or something like that, doing a small event, um, I always try and create relationships with all the new breweries, if if at all possible. Now, uh, do I remember this cr uh, correctly? I I feel like that you guys were definitely one of the first places uh, that I was exposed to the craft beer. Um, did you guys order, like, could people order cases from you at one point uh, a while back? I swear that I remember somewhere down in Carson Street that someone ordered uh, Charles Wells banana nut bread beer. Oh, wow. Uh, but this was a long time ago. This was mm -hmm. probably like, you know, uh, this was way back. But I remember somewhere down there, and I couldn't remember if they ordered it because they ordered a box from you. And I remember them calling around trying to find a place. Might have been you. Might not yeah. have been. 
So I will, if somebody has a special request as far as beer that they're looking for, I will try and get it for you if at all possible. Yeah. We cannot sell cases with our type of liquor license that we have. Okay. We could only sell two six packs at a time. Okay. So you could buy those six packs and walk out and come back in and buy yeah. another two six packs. So um, we've had requests for random stuff here and there. And if I'm able to get a hold of it, I will definitely try and do that. I mean, like over the years, you've obviously developed like a, uh, a lot of resources, I would say, for, you know, doing that. But like how difficult is it for, uh, for you guys to like... Uh, uh, I don't know. Is there like a, are you doing all this stuff yourself? Is there just like one main hub that you could be like, uh, you know, choose from a list? Do you guys have like a certain standard? Are you only carrying local stuff, regional? Like, how do you, how do you think about that now? So that in itself, the buying beer or beer cure, I call it curating beer yeah. because there are a lot of places that will just put on whatever your rep has on sale and, because it's cheap or whatever. So I call it curating beer because we take very special note to diversify our draft list by style and by brewery. So, um, you know, and that in itself, buying the beer in itself is a whole job. Before I took it over, that was literally a dedicated job to one person who would specifically just buy our beer. Because the hard thing about it is, which makes it not necessarily something easy for a business owner or somebody running a business to do is there's not one thing. There's a million things, especially with um, Pittsburgh. We're in that almost all of our local breweries are self-distributed. So, you know, you're going through emails from all the different breweries, mm -hmm. whatever they have available, or you're asking them at, while at the same time getting information from the distributors who there are probably, you know, four or five, um, main distributors in Pittsburgh and trying to combine that and balance that. Yeah. It's a very like complicated kind of dance you have to do with really planning ahead and, you know, looking at what people are liking and, you know, being in a million beer groups, seeing what people are drinking, what's the trend and stuff like that and balancing that with having a diversified draft list. And I mean, cans, and bottles, it's just crazy. There's a million different things out there these days. So I try and be selective as far as that goes. It'll probably be overwhelming. Yeah, you know, it's very overwhelming. That. <laughs> yeah, if I hadn't been doing it and like slowly got into it, to somebody to just jump into that position, it would be extremely difficult. Yeah. You're balancing getting emails throughout the whole week. It's not like you have one day where you're like, I'm going to buy all my beer. Yeah, It just doesn't, it can't work that way. What is like, I mean, like, what's your day to day as far as like, you know, are you, are you the one that's like, you know, buying all the shit, you yeah. know, you're buying all the materials, all the beers, everything like that. Yes. I mean, you probably have learned your, uh, learned your way around things over the, mm -hmm. over the years, but yeah. like, you know, uh, like how big is your squad down there? So we only have like eight or nine employees. So it's relatively small, yeah. which can be beneficial yeah. um, to us because we're able to pivot and we're able to do things that a larger establishment wouldn't necessarily be able to do. But I have like, um, I have a guy that does all of our food ordering. So I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Thankfully. I have a guy who like specifically slices all of our meats and cheeses. Wow. And then as far as like, Holy shit, I didn't even think about, <laughs> I swear. I, I yeah. didn't even think about that. Like you're doing all this all day yep. and you have to have a guy that's just cutting everything and preparing it. Literally that's his job from wow. like the time he comes in is just slicing me all day long slicing. Cause we want to have it fresh. Now, obviously. how do you, how do you go about like, uh, you know, finding the material, let's say the materials of mm -hmm. your sandwiches, you know, obviously you hear different places and forgive me if I'm speaking, uh, out of turn, but like you hear like boar's head places like that. Mm -hmm. There's a deli around here that uses it, but how do you go about like sourcing your ingredients and like, you know, how often does that change? It doesn't change very often, but we do it all by taste. Um, for instance, when we picked our corned beef, we did like just a blind taste test of probably 10 different corned beefs from 10 different companies or whatever the one that just tasted the best, wow. not regarding the brand. That's what we would go with. And we do that, you know, once we implemented it, we would do that with pretty much all of our meats and cheeses and stuff like that. How do you guys deal with the costs of 
all this stuff because we're using good ingredients like mm-hmm. cheeses and meats it's expensive already Absolutely. how do you deal with that and then keep the costs of your you know finished product you know purchasable yeah i mean honestly we are probably priced too low for what we should be like i just went to panera bread the other day <laughs> don't even mention it it's 30 dollars. literally it's for a garbage sandwich a half sandwich barely any meat a soup and a drink mm-hmm. you're paying like 18 19 dollars literally and we you, you get the same sandwich at the deli loaded up with local ingredients local bread and honestly our prices are lower than that and people will still complain about our prices yeah on a regular basis I'm like, guys, go to Panera Bread. You're going to pay 2 or $3 more a sandwich, and you, you know, you're going to get a, a very low quality. Yeah. I don't know if it's just like a perception or like, honestly, it, it's hard to say what, what that is in that regard. We should have higher prices, honestly. It's interesting to, you know, talk to uh, business owners that are making something that like, you know, are the you know you're you're paying for you know you're paying for what it is Mm -hmm. you know you get good quality things you're paying for it yeah but it's interesting to you know talk to people with similar mindsets because it's almost like we're dumb for even thinking that there's another way to think about it Mm -hmm. but there's other people that are like yeah we'll go to mcdonald's and we'll spend nine dollars on this yeah we'll complain because it's a sandwich for a few dollars more yeah but it's like i don't know I, i my hopes in you know, the podcast and like talking to all these people about like, you know, how the sausage is made Mm -hmm. is like, you know, kind of enlightening people to these things that like, you know, you don't really ever think about. Yeah, for sure. Everyone just like pops in and they're like, yeah, I want this sandwich, but it like so much goes into it. It's wild. Yeah. It's like, uh, it sucks that you have to justify those types of things. Yeah. A hundred percent. I totally agree with that. And it's really one of the things that I struggle with most as an owner is how do you get that balance yeah and um yeah it's like we we use good quality ingredients we pay our people well our rent is insane i bet (laughs) people still like (laughs) complain about it yeah it's tough but you know you just deal let me ask you the hard question obviously it's carson street deli Mm -hmm. you know is there you know ever thought of not being in south side has that ever been a business model's thought Honestly, yeah, it is. Gotta um, be, right? You yeah, know, for sure. I've logically. thought about it many times. And, uh, you know, I always think, you know, if I was in Lawrenceville, if I was in somewhere else, we'd be killing it. Yeah. And I think that some something will always exist in Southside just because that's where our heart is, that's where our community is, that's where, like, our people are. Yeah. And... Um, the namesake. Yeah. I don't think we would ever want to necessarily leave that. We could I'd be open to do other things, but there would have to be, I think there would always have to be something in Southside. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, all right. I mean, now you're obviously, you know, ripping and tearing on this. What do you think is the, like, how do you, how do you keep your, your mental about you? You know, I know you said you have a child, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, you have a family and it's like, you're, you have that life yeah. and then you have your business that you just bought and uh-huh. you're trying to, you know, all these plates spinning in the air. Yeah. It's like, what do you do for your mental well being? Honestly, it's very, very, very difficult. And I think that being a business owner is something that is, glorified and perceived it was almost like being a brewer where you're like oh man that's such a cool job and you get to brew beer and you oh, get yeah. to do this and the reality of it is it is hard Struggle. it is extremely hard hot as fuck back there yep absolutely Paid minimal yeah for sure it's and it's crazy. the same thing with being a small business owner you have this idea in your head of, oh you get to do what you want you're your own boss you know you get to make your own schedule <laughs> or do whatever and the reality of it is it's really really hard and you know it's non-stop it's 24 7 it's from the time you wake up from the time you go to sleep you're thinking about your business and you're worrying about your business it's very very hard i would say my daughter and my wife um are like my main things that kind of keep me grounded yeah and without them i don't know what i would do <laughs> yeah i wouldn't be able to to now, do it i mean like for you to take this over like how much of a a, a jump in this i mean like before you bought this mm-hmm. was this just was this just always 24 hours on your mind it sounded like it was i mean it was to some regard but even like before i bought it mike was like 
you think you know what it's going to be like now, but you don't. Yeah. Wait until you have it on your shoulders. Yeah. And, you know, you're responsible for these people's livelihoods. You're responsible for this thing, the deli, keeping it alive and stuff like that. It was, I was not expecting it to be as difficult emotionally and mentally as it actually is. Yeah. I mean, like, that's why I asked it because I know it got to be. Yeah. You know, I, th- this is nothing like this little podcast. I just, I just schedule with one person a week. <laughs> I only do this a little bit a week and, uh-huh. and I almost lose my fucking mind to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I know that uh, from talking to you, from talking to other business owners, like I know that it's just crazy. And it's just like, like I said, it's a hope that some people that listen to this, like, you know, uh, develop some sort of level of grace mm-hmm. for, you know, we're all just people just trying to figure shit out. And it's like, you were just figuring this out too. And, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's appreciative. It it, it, it makes me appreciative to hear from people Mm -hmm. that things are hard, that things are, uh, a work in progress that we're all just trying to figure stuff out because like you said, it's glorified. Like the, the position of being a business owner is, is glorified all the time, but, Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, uh, I feel like it's refreshing to hear the real side of it all. Well, I appreciate having like an outlet to actually say that. You ever or, do anything you know, like this podcast? Um, a few here and there, nothing like, I like that. It's like more than just like, usually it's like just sandwiches, just beer. Like, yeah, that this is, is like a little bit like, more. Yeah. I yeah. want to learn about like, I really want to learn about the people. Like obviously mm-hmm. people know about, you know, it's uh, on the, on the cover sheet, it says Carson street deli, but yeah. I want people to like get it, get something more about it. You know, when people see the name Dianoyas, like everyone knows the name Dianoyas. Yeah. But I want to hear Dave Dianoya or Dave Anoya rather tell me why you know, things start to develop like that. Yeah, for sure. I feel like that's kind of what made this is a, made this podcast appealing to people. Yeah. Uh, but all right. Uh, our, I mean, I think that we covered, I mean, do you think that we covered the business pretty well? Is oh, there anything absolutely. that I forgot you think? No, I appreciate it very much. Well, I, before I let you go, I gotta, uh, put you through the desert Island questions. Okay. All right, Desert Island Questions is a segment that I do with each one of my guests, uh, ending segment that I give each guest three categories to take with them on a desert island and use until they starve to death and die. Uh, first category is three movies to take on a desert island. Wow. I'm excited now that you said you were a film person. I know. Do you, do you, I mean, like, obviously with a kid now and like all this shit, it's yeah. probably hard to watch things. <laughs> What's yeah, like the yeah. last movie you watched that you were really impressed with? I, I honestly don't get a chance to watch new movies I bet. anymore. I bet. I'm just like, it's like Disney and stuff I like know. that. All it's gotta the time. be crazy. Um, movies that like have really, that I, I feel like I've connected with. Um, there will be blood. Yeah. Um, Star Wars just from nostalgia. Okay. Um, geez, and if I had to pick a third one, I don't know. I also like like light comedies that I don't have to think about. That's a help for my for, for my mental well being. Something where I could just turn it off. Yeah, and just like enjoy. Jeez, if I had to pick one, I'm trying to think of something that I would watch often. Do you do TV series? Yeah, questions? yeah. What's your TV series? Okay, I've watched like 30 Rock a million times, The Office a million times. Yeah. Probably one of those where okay. I could just like put that on a loop. That's good. I think it's so crazy that I said uh, three movies to be on a desert island to use until you starve death and die, and you're like, there will be blood. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis <laughs> just watching him at the edge of screaming. Yeah. Uh man, so good. Uh okay, so second category, uh I am a new reader. Okay, so I just started reading like a year ago. Okay. Uh a year almost to the day actually I started reading and I just can't stop. So you said that you used to read quite often. Yeah. I usually ask people three books, but I'm curious, like what what was like what did you read? I mean, at that time, I was literally picking up anything that was in front of me. Okay. Um, Lord of the Rings, the whole Lord of the Rings series, I was able to tackle. I was able to tackle, like, the whole Harry Potter series. I had a friend who was a, um, she was in the Armadillos with me, who was a, an English professor. Mm. So, she would give me weird, random, crazy books to read all the time. That's cool. So, I mean, at that point, it was like, 
anything I could get my hands on. Okay, so if you had to pick three books to take on a desert island, is that possible yeah. for you? Even um, if they could be series? I would say Lord of the Rings. That's pretty good? Yeah. I just got it. It was on sale, uh, oh. and I just got it. And so I'm, I'm like, I'm really trying to uh, abide my time as far as, like, you know, taking these, like, journeys. Like, mm. I just read... Uh, uh, the longest book I ever read from Stephen King, it was like uh, 900 pages. And like, that was a big, it was a big feat for me mm. uh, after never reading really. Yeah. I, I just never cared about it. But people were like, yeah, just bide your time for the Dark Tower, bide your time for the Gunslinger, bide your time for Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah. You know, but that's coming up on my list, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. It's I, a really good one. I, I've only watched the movies whenever they came out. That's one how time. I started too. Yeah. I originally had just watched the movies and then read the books afterwards and it was like, psh- yeah, I got. I know. I got to watch it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Or I got to read it rather. Okay. So those are. Uh, I mean, that's that's good, right? Yeah. I was like, uh, like it's a little cl- cliche, but David Edgar's like a uh, heartbreaking work of staggering genius, or even like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, are two like big ones too. Are you a motorcycle guy? No, it has not a whole lot to do with actual motorcycle maintenance. It's oh. the story of like a um, a father and a son going on a road trip on a motorcycle. Oh, wow. So it's like all kinds of, a little bit of like philosophical stuff. Nice. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, okay, third category is three CDs. Wow. I'm also a huge music fan. Um, and I'm fortunate through this job to be able to go to a lot of concerts and stuff like that because tough. Yeah. <laughs> Tough. So, uh, probably definitely bright eyes, mm. maybe lifted bright eyes is huge influence on me. Um, oh, Connor. Yeah. I absolutely love everything that he does. Maybe the Decemberists. Okay. Um, and then I don't know. I also am into like a lot of old folk stuff. So maybe some like older Pete Seeger, Mm. Um, albums or Woody Guthrie, something like that. Okay. Yeah. It, what's the best concert you've ever been to? <sighs> That's tough. Probably two, which are two that I've mentioned. I saw Decemberists when they toured for Crane Wife um, in Cleveland, and that was just, that was like right on the verge to where they were like blowing up at the time, but they were like not huge. So yeah. they like came out to the crowd and stuff like that. And oh, it was cool. really like an emotional attachment. And then when I um, Bright Eyes Digital Ash came out, they co-headlined with The Faint, um, which was also happened to be in Cleveland. But that was also just like mind blowing. I'm mean, like, you know, probably like 18 or so. So like, yeah. just like those like emo kind of like feelings. Oh and yeah, like seeing it live loved it. was like I loved yeah. it. Miss it. Yeah, <laughs> miss them emo days. We were just at Burgettstown last night for a show, and it's just like thinking about warp tours there. Oh yeah, uh, you're just like man. So many, so many days on this on for this sure. earth. Yeah, uh, definitely crazy. Okay, uh, third to last uh, question is the death row meal. So, uh, death row meal, you get an appetizer, a main course, and a dessert. Last mm. meal before you just get canned. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, as far as that goes, I'm kind of a simple guy. I would take like maybe some, uh, some like greasy mozzarella sticks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, for a main course, I would do maybe just like a good grilled steak and potatoes. Yep. That's a standard. Yep. And dessert. <sighs> I'm not super huge on sweets, but, um, Maybe a Charleston chew. A Charleston <laughs> chew. Yeah. That's good. What is uh what's your go to for the menu at the deli? Um honestly it's hard for me to still eat <laughs> deli sandwiches yeah. just from eating them every day for like my whole life. I bet. Um but I I'll do like a combination of a couple of things. I'll do a Godfather, which is Genoa and Sopersada, okay. with red peppers and provolone. But I like to add some pesto on there with some uh fresh mozzarella and some banana peppers my god yeah that sounds good super good i am uh i'm terrible because i'm a creature of habit i just get the buffalo chicken with the blue cheese every time oh i get it and it's so good yeah honestly it's my favorite one uh the blue cheese fantastic but people uh my wife got something different i tried that and that was great and i feel like i've just been missing out for years because i've been getting the same thing 
And it's funny, there are people who come in, literally been coming in for years, and they'll look at the menu every time they come in. They're like, I'm going to try something different today. Yeah. I'm never like, that's do. what everybody says. <laughs> and then, nope, they just get the same <laughs> thing they always get. And I get it. And I totally Is understand. there like a fan favorite? Like, what's like the most popular? Um, probably the Reuben and uh, the Balboa are yeah. like our top two. Yeah. What's the least popular? Honestly, it's hard to say. Yeah, um, I mean, we've taken a few of them off that end up just like trailing off. Yeah, I would say personally, I don't really like what, and I inherited the name too of uh, our po boy, which is crab cakes, um, with like tartar sauce or hot sauce and this and tomato. And it's just like uh, I understand it. People like it. People get it. Yeah. I would take it off if it were up to me. Yeah. Again, that's one of the ones where like people people were like, like pissed rebel. about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so funny. That's good though. Uh, okay, uh, second to last question. You get ready to go on a road trip. You go into a gas station to get a snack of choice. What is it? Uh, combos, pizza combos. combos. It's so weird because like, I would say pizza combos are. I would say the second. The second highest choice really? on here. That's awesome. I know. Ain't that so surprising? <laughs> yeah. Because, like, I don't know the last time I bought combos. I yeah. used to love them as a kid, uh-huh. but I don't know the last time I got them. But people people always choose pizza combos and Cheez-Its mm, all okay. the time. All the time. Nice. It's very weird. Uh, steak and potato is always, yeah. you know, that's the main answer. Uh-huh. Uh, appetizer, I would say mozzarella sticks is really? getting up there. Oh, I swear awesome. to God, it's it's very surprising because huh. I'm a I love a mozzarella stick. That's yeah. that's one of my choices. But yeah, it's interesting to always hear people's uh, take on it. Okay, last uh, l- actually before the last question, what do, what's a re- a good restaurant you like in the city? Um, Oak Hill Post, which is in Brookline. I literally live a block away from it. How good. And I've been able to go there since they opened. So, um, you know, Christian and Rebecca, the owners there, I've been able to kind of, you know, and they know I'm in Delhi. So we kind of have like a back and forth relationship. Hell yeah. And um, just so good. I love what those guys do. And I love that they do what they want to do. Love it. They're like, I envy that. That's like, you know, the deli that like, you know, I can't have them. I'm stuck with some of these menu items. Yeah. And they're just like, we're doing exactly what we want to do. So <laughs> that's, I respect that. One of my favorite spots. I go there all the time. Yeah. Uh, and Christian and Rebecca, I have to, uh, you know, I'll let you know on the secret. That's the burger I was talking about. We were at Honestly, dinner. I thought so. Yeah, we were at dinner <laughs> yeah. and he was like, yeah, we took it off. And I was like, all right, all right, we'll see how it goes. And he was like, it was a fucking wreck. Yeah. He was yeah. like, people were pissed. Uh-huh. And he was like, I just didn't understand it. Yeah. I was like, bro, it's one of the best ones in the city. Exactly. Like, I mean, you cannot, you can't, you yeah. can't argue with it. I had a feeling that might, that might I be. I know. <laughs> I know. It's so good. Uh, always love to shout out to uh, Oak Hill Post. Um, okay. Uh, last question. If you could have a conversation with anyone alive or dead, who would it be and why? If it's not a loved one. Okay. Yeah. I would say... Jar Jar Banks. <laughs> what is it? Jar Jar Banks. Oh, that would Star be a good Wars one. Kids. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, probably... Oh, jeez. Um, somebody who I really respect just for what they kind of did with their life is Pete Seeger. Mm. Um, you know, he was always an advocate for workers' rights and people's rights and for doing what's right. And, um, yeah, I respect that a lot. That's a good answer. Do you still get to play music? Not as much anymore. Yeah, not as much anymore. Everything takes a back seat. Yep. Yeah. The armadillo has kind of stopped playing like right before COVID and, uh, no, I just never really picked it up since then. And then I bought the deli and now it's like, (laughs) (laughs) good luck. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking some time to talk to me. Uh, Please take a second to tell everyone where they could go grab a great sandwich and a good beer, where they could follow you on Instagram, the whole thing. Uh, It's uh, Carson Street Deli. Our Instagram is CarsonStreetDeli.CraftBeerBar. We're on Facebook, X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Best Brew Deli is what X or Twitter is. And website is CarsonStreetDeliAndCraftBeerBar.com. 1507 East Carson Street. Hell yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, coming and talking yeah, to me about this. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Everyone else that's listening, appreciate Yins as usual. Each and every week, we're back with another great guest doing great things in the city. Thank you for listening. Call you right back. There you go. Awesome. Absolutely. I thought it was great. Yeah. Very interesting. Very, very interesting.